Hello, everyone. <laughs> Just wait a couple seconds. I'm going to have a seat. I know nobody wants to sit in the front rows like the movies, you know. <laughs> cool. How was the keynote? Was it good? You enjoyed it? I, I missed it, so I'll have to catch the recording later if there is one. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming to this session. So we're going to be doing a session today on a human versus AI. And in this session, I'm going to show you how to build a mobile app with Vue.js, MLKit, and NativeScript. And I'm just curious, how many Vue leavers do I have in here? How many Vue developers? I see one. I see two. I wore my Vue shirt. Oh, there's three. Oh, awesome. OK, well, then um, we'll talk a little bit about Vue to kind of introduce you to this framework. And um, we'll talk about MLKit, which is a new product by Google. Uh, and we'll talk about NativeScript. NativeScript developers. Where's my NativeScript developers? Mobile developers? Awesome. This is going to be great. OK, good. We're going to have some fun. So my name is Jen Looper, and I work here at Progress. Uh, I'm a senior developer advocate here in the company, and I'm also the founder and CEO of Vue Vixen. So I wore my honorary fox. Uh, which is awesome, but I really appreciate that was given to me. Uh, so Vue Vixens is actually, I'll just give a little shout out to my, uh, my initiative. So it's something that I founded to help uh, um, increase inclusion and diversity in the Vue community. It's part, it was uh, modeled after NG Girls, which is um, in the Angular community. What they do is they have workshops for women, and they're done uh, partnering with conferences. So we do the same thing in the Vue community, mostly with Vue conferences and also other kinds of conferences. Um, so we've, we've done, I don't know, how many workshops at this point, maybe 15, I think, um, over the year. Um, I, it was founded in February, so we've just been going crazy. It's been really um, a successful initiative. If you're interested, take a look at viewvixens.org. So it's a very fun um, initiative, and we have also a lot of chapters. So I'd love to have one start up here in Sofia. That would be super. So just let me know <laughs> if you're interested in starting a chapter. So, OK. So, um, I am a developer advocate, but I'm also known in my department as a friend of bots. I have an affinity for chat bots. I really like kind of tinkering around with Slack. I made a Slack bot uh, because my manager, Burke, was um, constantly late to meetings. So I made a little Slack bot you know, saying, at five minutes after the hour, when we were supposed to have a meeting, I had a, a chatbot come up and say, you know, Burke, are you dead or something? You know, so <laughs> just kind of to harass your manager, very useful for this sort of thing. Um, come on in, have a seat. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Jen Looper, by the way. I have my Twitter handle in these slides. <laughs> All right. So on our agenda today is, hi, Brian. <laughs> we're going to talk about what machine learning is. And we're going to talk about why machine learning is so important. And we're going to talk a little bit about the how of machine learning. How can machine learning help make more interesting mobile apps? And very specifically, how can I build an app using two new technologies, MLKit and NativeScript Vue? So we're going to talk about how these kind of work together to create a really engaging user experience for your mobile users. So I like to start with um, some kind of fun slides about what machine learning is. Uh, so what is machine learning? Um, I like this GIF that my colleague TJ sent me. It's actually not this, although it's cute. Uh, it's uh, as we know, machine learning is easy, right? So uh, anybody gone through this course on Coursera? It's a pretty amazing course uh, by uh, Andrew Ng, who was chief data scientist at Baidu and moved to Stanford and basically spun up Coursera by starting this course teaching machine learning. And it's really heavy on the math. I, if you're interested at all in, in machine learning, I strongly suggest that you take this course. Just force yourself through it. You know, um, it's, it's really worthwhile, and it gives you a good introduction to what machine learning is. But machine learning, as we know, is not easy. So what exactly is it? Well, one definition is that machine learning is a way to give computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And this is kind of one of those vague and generic descriptions. So a better description is that you can say that a computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks T and performance measure P 
if its performance at tasks T, as measured by P, improves with experience E. Isn't that a gem? That's wonderful. So <laughs> that's Tom Mitchell in 1997. That's the classic uh, definition of what machine learning is. You can come have a seat if you'd like to. Come on in. Come, come. Um, and it, for me, this makes me kind of lie on the floor and quiver. It's, 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 um, it's not the easiest thing to get your mind around, but I just want to uh, highlight the word improves. What you want is for the algorithm to, uh, to improve in accuracy as you send it more and more data. So let's just go through a couple of ways that you can make a machine learn kind of a couple of definitions of different types of machine learning. And um, I, use, I use Emoji and Bitmoji a lot in this because I think it makes it a little more accessible. Um, I'm influenced by my colleague Tara, who uses a lot of terrible jokes and GIF guides to a difficult concepts. So <laughs> we'll just go through this. So one of the main uh, strategies of machine learning, one of the main techniques of machine learning, is actually called supervised learning. So what is supervised learning? Supervised <laughs> Tara. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, poof, Tara's here. Well, here's the, uh, the emoji guide to machine learning. Okay, so supervised learning, you gather a lot of data, right? My favorite way to gather data, go shopping. And you divide that data into a training set and a test set. You give your training set labels, so you categorize your training set. So here I've divided my training set into fruits and vegetables. And then you don't give any categories to your uh, test set. Send this along to your algorithm, which is going to sort through this data, and it's going to make what I call educated guesses. So it's going to use the test set to make su some suggestions, and then the training set is going to verify whether that is a, a correct assumption or incorrect assumption. It'll return with a sort of an accuracy reading, and then it'll say, you know, iterate again and try to improve on your identification of these things. So this is a good example of what machine learning, of what supervised learning looks like. And a lot of, I would maybe, 75% of all machine learning is still supervised learning, kind of this basic idea of machine learning. But there are other types of machine learning, and one of them is unsupervised learning. You can kind of get the drift of where this is going. So again, you gather data, but this time you don't give any categories to this data. So that's, um, that's a different, little bit different strategy. This is unsupervised learning, so you don't categorize the data, and you send it to a little bit more complicated uh, self-teaching pattern-recognizing algorithm. And that algorithm is going to make what I call uneducated guesses. We haven't done any sorting of data prior to it, so it's going to make uneducated guesses, and it's going to return with, um, with an uh, accuracy rating. So it's basically um, it's self-teaching, so it's trying to improve on itself. It's trying to look for patterns in the data that you send it and figure it out for itself. So this is more complicated and kind of more interesting, uh, unsupervised learning. So fun fact, my husband is a uh, professor at MIT in the EECS department, and um, a lot of their staff may meetings revolve around the anxiety that the CS department is feeling about unsupervised or reinforcement learning. And it seems to me that if MIT is scared, then we should be really scared. <laughs> so um, they're kind of, at this point, when the machines are getting smarter than the humans, and they're sort of, um, and the humans can't quite understand what the machines are, are, are thinking, uh, then I think we have to watch this and make sure we have an off switch <laughs> on that thing. So the last type of machine learning I just want to call out is called reinforcement learning. So this is really next level stuff, and this is where the, the folks at MIT are, are, are kind of scratching their head. Reinforcement learning allows you to, again, gather data. Again, you don't give it any kind of categories, and you send it to an even more complex algorithm. This is a curious self-teaching pattern recognizing algorithm. So what you do is you give it harder and harder problems, and you reward its curiosity. So you, you, you ask the algorithm itself to evolve and, and, and invent categories for itself and invent guesses. It's going to be guessing, and it's giving, so you give it harder and harder problems and reward the algorithm for being more and more accurate. And this is actually, um, this is um, a strategy that's in, uh, informed by uh, child psychology, actually, so it's kind of interesting. It's all cognitive science, child psychology, and what I like to say is when you let moms go after this data <laughs> and, uh, and you have this sort of thing uh, being created. So this kind of curious uh, algorithm is going to make uneducated guesses and get better and better because it's curious. So it's a really interesting uh, kind of new and um, edgy uh, method of uh, machine learning. So something to watch and uh, something to kind of just read articles about, kind of see what's going on in the field. It's a very interesting field and it's um, evolving very, very quickly. 
So um, if you're interested in ha making machine learning work for you on your own computer, you can have uh, access to some really awesome tools. And one of my favorites is TensorFlow. And it's Google's library for machine learning. It's open source. It's free. And you can install it. I have it installed on this unfortunate computer. <laughs> so if you are cold in the winter and you want to be toasty warm, you just fire up TensorFlow, you know, put it on your lap, and you have you know, it's very useful for um, making your computer get really, really hot. <laughs> but it's really, really fun to play with. If you're interested in learning about TensorFlow, you can do code labs, which are really fun. And my very favorite one is called TensorFlow for Poets. Uh, I made a bit.ly for you, so TF for Poets. And um, it basically gives you a large data set of flowers and shows you how um, this is supervised learning. So you, you store all this data into uh, labeled folders, and then you ask TensorFlow to identify flowers based on the algorithm that it's using. So um, it's a really, really cool way of learning. Very nicely done. I love. Uh, Google Code Labs for learning anything Googleish, so very very useful. And there is also a relatively new project called TensorFlow JS. This is very very fun. Uh, so for all of us JavaScript people who don't want to mess with Python so much for TensorFlow, you can um, access TensorFlow APIs in JavaScript now. It's uh, TensorFlow JS, also open source, free and available for you at js.tensorflow.org, and it's a JavaScript library for training and deploying machine learning models in the browser using Node. And uh, the demo that they have is called the Emoji Scavenger Hunt. This is like really after my own heart. I love this stuff. It's just a little. Uh, it's done in web browser, so you have to use Chrome, and it makes you chase through your house looking for objects that it's using the camera to identify. Uh, just really fun and really, it really makes you, you move because it's very, very fast. It's all happening on device. It's really, really neat. So take a look at TensorFlow um, JavaScript, uh, TensorFlow.js at this URL and, uh, and see where you go. So in your mind for now, just bookmark TensorFlow. We're going to come back to it because we're going to leverage it in MLKit. Let's talk a little bit about machine learning in the wild. So I think machine learning is touching our lives in ways that we don't even realize now. Um, I have seen that my new car, I just got a new Prius, that thing is so smart. <laughs> it's, um, it gives me a, a score because it has sensors all around the car. It gives me a score every time I, I park it of how well I did in terms of driving. And um, it's training me <laughs> how to drive. <laughs> so it's, um, it's a very triggering car, but it's a very, very good machine. Uh, and these sort of things are just you know, becoming more and more um, almost commonplace which is good and bad. So we'll talk a little bit about um, the good and bad uses of machine learning as we go through. But one of the good uses of machine learning that I really enjoy is called Stitch Fix. Um, Stitch Fix is one of these box services. So they're very popular in the States. Uh, every month you get shipped um, a selection of clothing, and you, know, you end up looking fabulous at the end of the day. And it actually gets kind of expensive, so I cut that thing off. <laughs> so Tara, you tried it too, right? <laughs> yeah. So what it does, though, is, is, is they have some really great data scientists in New York City, and they're combining machine learning with human curation. So the way the input loop goes is that you, as a user, log into Stitch Fix, download their mobile app, and you indicate your style preferences. It almost gives you like a, a, user, a user interface looks like Tinder for clothes, so you're swiping back and forth saying, I like this, I don't like that. And it's, you know, you're giving your information to Stitch Fix, and then they're running that input through a nice algorithm. So it's going to be basically building a recommendation engine, which is one of the really common uses of machine learning, is building recommendations. It's factoring in your location, trends in your area. You know, people don't dress the same in Boston as in New York. We're usually 10 years behind New York, so here we are. <laughs> um, it's factoring in this season. You know, if you're in Florida, you're not going to dress like, uh, like in Toronto. Uh, that's really a bad idea. <laughs> Um, and then it's connecting a sh the shopper to a stylist, and the stylist is actually human, as far as I as far as I know. <laughs> so mine is Rebecca. I'm pretty sure she's human. And this stylist is stylist is going to use your input and what the algorithm is telling her to ship to kind of curate a selection of clothing and then ship out a box to you. So that's really nice. And then the input loop is closed when you give feedback, and you give feedback by buying everything, basically, <laughs> so or returning. You can always return items if you don't like them. So a very nice use of kind of um, a nice machine learning, a nice opt-in solution with machine learning, plus human curation, plus a closed input loop. It works really nicely. This is a good use of machine learning. It makes you look fabulous at the end of the day, and that's what we all want, right? There are also some really scary uses of machine learning. This 
image went around Twitter actually a while ago, and um, it basically shows how um, the surveillance cameras, I think this is probably in Shanghai or Beijing, are able to use face detection algorithms to see where everybody is, who they are, and what they're up to. And um, I, I don't want to call out China in specifically, but they, uh, there's an awful lot of surveillance cameras in these cities. Uh, however, the most surveilled city, turns out, I was told, is London. So, <laughs> very interesting. And the silver lining to all this is that it's now extremely safe to drive in China, <laughs> So because everyone knows they're being watched, so they just drive in a really normal fashion, and it's really good. We went straight, straight from China to South Korea, and it was like night and day, very interesting. So, if you install a ton of surveillance cameras, right, you're going to get a lot of data, and you're going to be able to get really good at facial recognition algorithms, and you're able to match faces to IDs. Everyone in uh, Asia, in China, is uh, in a database. And you can monitor group emotions, that's always fun. And you can track their location. It's not like Uber and Facebook don't do this, right? So not to call out you know, any particular country, but this sort of surveillance is, um, for me, a big nope, because it is not opt-in. I prefer stitch fix methods, you know, you can opt-in and everything's good. So for me, this is a big nope. Um, but there are also some really interesting good and bad uses of machine learning. So at, at, back to MIT. MIT uh, was asked by the Boston Public Schools to help them optimize school bus routes. It turns out that um, in the Boston Public Schools budget, the most expensive thing that they have is uh, bus routes. It's, it's quite expensive, and they're trying to figure out you know, where the kids are. I think Brian had some interesting experience with the Boston Public School bus routes. Um, so anyway, these kids decided, all right, we're going to go at this, we're going to take mapping data, we're going to figure out the routes, and we're going to optimize this. And they were really successful. So they um, eliminated 50 superfluous routes. They had saved three to five million dollars out of that nice fat line item that they were supposed to um, get rid of. And then we put 50 union bus drivers right out of work. So this is, you know, this is the, the sort of the problems that can go when you're asking awesome engineers from MIT to do cool things without thinking it through all the way. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that they help these guys find some employment. I have my doubts, but just something to think about. At some point in your career, if you're a data scientist or if you're a developer, you have some, you know, some guy in a suit is going to say, hey, this, is, this seems like a great idea, let's try this. And at, I mean, we're the developers. Nothing gets built unless we say OK. So at some point, it would be really cool that if we had the power and were empowered to say, let's think this through, maybe not OK. So this is the message of this talk, actually, that I want to convey. So as I like to say, with great power comes great responsibility. Right with machine learning. So as you're asked to build stuff, you know, think about, think about the ramifications. Okay, so back to reality. Uh, let's talk about how to use machine learning on your mobile phone. Mobile devices are the perfect little uh, device to collect all this data that uh, makes machine learning algorithms really fly. So uh, they're packed with sensors, we're giving them data all the time, voice data, images, uh, and then they have these nice mobile apps that are just basically supercharging all of your data and, and sending it God knows where. So uh, <laughs> very interesting little devices. Machine learning and mobile is love. And we, as app developers, once we've thought everything through, right, we have a new arsenal, right? You can make your apps smarter, you can make them more helpful by building an entire app around machine learning uh, algorithms. For example, Seeing AI, which is a demo app from Microsoft, very, very good app. It's um, designed for people with uh, visual impairments. So it allows you to, for example, take um, dollar bills and euros, and you can scan them and figure out the denominations, the value of, of, of paper money, which you know, for a blind person would be really, really difficult. Um, it allows you to look at you know, colors in the closet so that you can figure out what to wear. It um, allows you to you know, scan documents. It's a really nice app, completely built on um, image recognizing algorithms. Very, very good. So kudos to Microsoft, they're doing great work on this. Or you can have an app like Shazam, which also is built entirely around, um, around uh, audio recognition algorithms. Do you, does anyone use Shazam anymore? Okay, because I always feel like this is not a thing. But um, it's actually, there's really interesting integrations with Shazam. Uh, we can talk about that later. But this, pardon my terrible taste in music, but Shazam is really useful for <laughs> recognizing <laughs> things that play. There's also a really hysterical game show called Beat Shazam. Have you seen this thing? So um, it basically has a panel of about five humans, and then Shazam is running in the background, and they play a tiny clip of music, and the humans usually can identify it faster than the machine. It's kind of interesting, but that, that show actually inspired this entire talk. So 
and really fun to watch. So you can build your entire app around machine learning, or you can use little snippets, little bits of machine learning within your app uh, and make your apps more helpful, just a little bit more helpful. For example, uh, Facebook Marketplace, which has a brilliant integration. When you're trying, I, I recently moved, so I had to sell a lot of stuff. I had to sell a lot of furniture. So you can take a picture of you know, your chair or whatever, and then it's going to scan all the images that people have been uploading in Facebook Marketplace and figure out what they've sold for and give you an idea how much you should charge. I really like this because I never know in my area what my stuff is worth. Very, very useful. So, but it's just a one-line item in the Facebook Marketplace that is, that is really brilliantly um, done for, with a little bit of machine learning. Uh, another good example of uh, machine learning within an app is uh, Spotify. It's ba basically figuring out what you're clicking on, what you're listening to, and uh, making a recommendation engine for you, but that's just part of Spotify. So um, that's something to think about. OK, back to reality, back to what we're actually in the process of building. Um, so I think what I've tried to explain is that do-it-yourself machine learning is actually really hard. You can heat up your <laughs> MacBook and make TensorFlow really fly, um, but you really need a lot of firepower and a lot of skills, especially if you start really working in the algorithmic world and dealing with you know, starting to tweak, tweak the actual algorithms. It's really difficult. You're going to need a lot of training and a lot of skills. But you have some other options. One of these other options is that you can try a third-party service um, and you can make API calls out, right? So you can um, query their models, query their servers, and get some information back to get labels for your images. For example, Clarify. I used to be crazy about Clarify. I've been preaching Clarify. I'm basically like unofficial DevRel for Clarify. <laughs> Brilliant New York City company. They are one of the best in the world at um, image recognition. Um, and recently, they were written up as uh, doing a really nefarious um, project that's basically helping drones kill people more effectively. So big nope on Clarify. <laughs> so, and apparently some employees are walking out, so it's very interesting. I mean, it's not like Google doesn't do that too. Google Cloud Platform, also you can you know, always query Google Cloud Platform and get data back for your images or for your audio. So that's really fun. Um, but what I want to talk about today is MLKit. MLKit is relatively new. It was um, I'm not sure if it was launched at Google I.O. It was launched before, but it was really talked up a lot at Google I.O. It's still in beta, but YOLO. <laughs> we can play with it now. So let's think about how we can use some of these tools to build a really cool mobile app. So my smorgasbord of tools is using Vue.js. We've got my Vue levers in here. You know the deal. Can I have a minute to talk about Vue.js? <laughs> and NativeScript for your mobile app. Together, Vue and NativeScript is NativeScript Vue. And the developer of NativeScript Vue, Igor, he is here in the conference. He's um, a college student. It's astounding. So uh, if you see Igor, buy him a beer for me because he is amazing. This is Igor. And I love this picture because it always looks like he's thinking, you know, did I leave the oven on? So um, Igor is great. And give him a big pat on the back for me. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about NativeScript. I think a lot of folks are maybe are new to NativeScript, but that's OK. Let's talk about how we can use NativeScript to build a mobile app. So what is NativeScript? It is an open source framework for building truly native mobile apps with JavaScript. And you can use your web skills like TypeScript, Angular, and now Vue.js and CSS and get native UI and performance on iOS and Android. So I'll, I'll unpack some of these buzzwords for you. Basically, you're using JavaScript to build a lovely, a lovely mobile app that has this nice native experience. And this is an app in the App Store called Examples Native Script that shows kind of the nice animations that you can use. And this is all you know, done with JavaScript, but it is, uh, being, um, it is using JavaScript to build this native experience. And you can share uh, a certain amount of code between your web app and your native mobile app, which is another plus. So that's really fun. And I work at a lot of booths, and I say the word native script, and people freak out <laughs> because they don't want to learn another language. Well, it's not another language, it's just JavaScript. So no, no fear, no worries. Uh, you can use basically the web skills that you already have, right? You can use JavaScript, CSS3. You can use NPM packages when you need to create plugins. I see my plugin master right there. <laughs> so if you have any questions about plugins, talk to Eddie. He's amazing. Uh, you can use Angular. And you can use SAS if you like SAS. That's the Webpack logo. So you're definitely going to be using Webpack when you're compiling your Angular app. Also, you need it for Vue.js uh, to make the single file components work. If you like TypeScript, you can use that. And now we have this lovely port for Vue, so NativeScript Vue. So why port? 
we already have a wonderful Angular integration, why would you go ahead and use Vue? Well, Vue actually, similar to Angular, has this adoption of the virtual DOM, and it enables native mobile rendering. So like Angular 2, when Vue 2 came out, we have this ability to start building for native uh, devices. So Vue also offers a really nice way for web developers you know, to use their skills to embrace mobile platforms. And this was actually pioneered by um, Alibaba in China. Uh, they, um, they have a product called Weeks. And fortunately, they open sourced it, so we were able to borrow some of those concepts. So kudos to Wix. They did a really good job kind of pioneering the use of Vue for mobile. But uh, native script Vue is better. So <laughs> uh, Vue is lightweight also. I think, I think it's really appropriate for mobile. It's a lovely, lightweight framework, and I think you're going to love it if you try it. So NativeScript and Vue also have this nice code sharing potential. So you, if you have a web app, you know, maybe you can use some of that code in your mobile app. So it's really, uh, it has a terrific potential, and people are already porting uh, their apps into, into production right now, their NativeScript Vue apps. If you would like to try NativeScript Vue, here's the sales pitch right now. Um, you can take a look at the playground, play.nativescript.org. Let's um, see if I can bump. So the way this works, oh, you can read my email. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> you are going to be using a couple of apps in the playground. Two, you're going to download two mobile apps, the Play app and the Viewer app, and then you're going to start scanning QR codes. So I'm going to pop a QR code here. This is a nice View app. I'll just take a scan, and then this will start refreshing. I'm working on this app. Sneak peek of Teramoji. <laughs> so this is basically what's going on here. So this is a NativeScript Vue app, and you can see that we have hello world.view. That's a single file component done in Vue. Uh, if I would go into here, and where's my action bar? So I can just say, hey, Sophia, save it, and then boom, you've got it. So it's a really nice and fast way that people really appreciate to sort of scaffold up um, a mobile app, start building, and um, you know, before you have to do any big installs using the CLI. Just try, try it before you buy it, basically, in, uh, in Playground. OK, so I'll go back to this. Here we go. OK, so we've talked about machine learning. We've talked about the do's and don'ts. We've talked about some of the tools that you can use. So let's talk about making a machine learning powered mobile app using NativeScript Vue and MLKit. So a match made in heaven, this is awesome. You're going to love it. MLKit basically allows you to do do-it-yourself machine learning, which is admittedly difficult, a little bit easier. Because what it is, is it's a nice library built by Google. Thanks, Google. It's machine learning on device using a plugin. Guess what, guess what plugin? It uses Firebase. Very interesting. It's built on top of Firebase. We'll talk a little about that. But you would love MLKit if you don't want to make uh, a bunch of costly REST API calls externally. First of all, that kind of app is not going to work offline. Uh, and eventually, these services, these third-party services like Clarify and Google Cloud Platform are going to start charging you. <laughs> so that can get expensive. Again, if you need offline capability, you need machine learning running on device. And if you want to train something really custom, you could train a model um, locally on TensorFlow, compress it, and use it in, ML, in MLKit on device. So um, it's a really has a ton of potential, a lot of power, and I think um, it's a really great solution. So MLKit is powered by TensorFlow, TensorFlow Lite. So TensorFlow Lite was um, it, second generation. The first generation was called TensorFlow Mobile, and then they decided to port it for Raspberry Pi, so they renamed it and called it TensorFlow Lite. So they're having a lot of fun at Google, <laughs> and I hope they're enjoying themselves. But they um, have some really nice demo apps that you can try for TensorFlow Lite. Um, you can use image recognition, image manipulation, kind of these recognition um, algorithms, and it's all ready to go. So MLKit is built using that. I love MLKit. It is a really, really sweet product. So I encourage you to try it. Hey, it's free. What could go wrong? <laughs> right? So image, uh, sorry, MLKit comes built with certain um, built-in strategies, built-in technologies. It comes built with image labeling, so you can identify objects, which is kind of the most common use case for me. It comes with some really nice OCR, some text recognition, so you can, you know, scan documents and extract text. You could go to the store and, you know, scan labels and that kind of thing. 
Face detection, that's kind of a note for me. I'm not real interested in face detection, but you know, maybe some people. Maybe we could do a face swapping thing and you know, swap with our cat or something, <laughs> something not too nefarious. Uh, barcode scanning, that could be useful if you're building sort of a product-based app. Landmark detection, it can tell the difference between uh, very, very similar bridges. There's a bridge in Brazil that's extremely similar to the Golden Gate Bridge, and it instantly tells the difference. So that's really nice. So all of this is already built into MLKit, and it comes it comes with its own models, so you can basically make generic calls against it, or you can train something custom and bring it into MLKit if you like. So how does this thing work? It leverages Firebase. Now this is kind of interesting. Why would it use Firebase? Because that's where all your data is coming in. <laughs> so all of your data flows into your app with Firebase, so they decided we'll put MLKit right on top of that, and then uh, you know where that you know where that data is going. <laughs> so thanks, Google. Anyway, leveraging Firebase to access your app's data, it's also bundling together Google's ML technologies, which are admittedly awesome: Google, Google Cloud Vision API, TensorFlow Lite, and the Android Neural Networks API, all together in the single SDK. And this thing works on device; it works offline. So it's pretty incredible and pretty fun fun to try. Let's put MLKit to the test with NativeScript View, since we're talking about putting these things together. So I created the next blockbuster game. You're going to love it. It's called Pick Me, and it's a game testing MLKit's accuracy and speed against your own. So what I wanted to see is whether a human can more quickly and more accurately identify very tricky images. So I'll show you um, the images that I chose in a minute, uh, versus the bot running on device. So it's, it's making uh, suggestions on what it thinks it sees. But normally, actually, a human can be a little bit faster, but we'll, we'll test. Um, so what I wanted to do is do the ultimate challenge. So <laughs> there's a woman um, on Instagram called Teeny Biscuit. I suggest you follow her. She's amazing. And she's put together these um, really cute collages of tricky pictures. So this is Labradoodle versus fried chicken. Um, there's also parrot versus guacamole. I have them all. <laughs> I basically screenshotted them all, sliced them up, and used them in my app. Uh, lots of good, good and fun, clean fun for everyone to try. So Pick Me uses these tricky images, and it has a swipe mechanism so that the humans are detecting the image, and the bot is also looking at the image and making suggestions on what it thinks it is, giving labels. So how did I build it? I used the Vue CLI template. This is um, the Vue 2 way of doing things. In the future, I think we will not use this template to create a NativeScript Vue app. We'll use a plugin that's coming in the future. So just stay tuned if you're interested in this sort of thing. I used three plugins, Firebase, Image Swipe, and one more, which I can't remember. <laughs> It'll come to me. <laughs> and I used Vuex for state management. Oh, yes, the card plugin, because within the swipe layout, there's a card. So those are the three big plugins that I used. So here's how you scaffold an app right now. You use the Vue CLI with a template, and you just do Vue init native script, Vue, Vue CLI template, give the app a name, and then it comes with some suggestions on what to, uh, the application identifier is and this sort of thing. It asks if you want to install a couple things. You can usually say yes, especially to Vuex for state management. And then you can choose a color scheme. So this is a very uh, cool and neat way to scaffold yourself a nice NativeScript View app. And then here are the three plugins I was mentioning earlier. These are the useful plugins. There's NativeScript Swipe Layout for swiping. Inside the Swipe Layout, there's Card View. And then there's this monster Firebase plugin <laughs> that Eddie is working on kind of nonstop, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of a beast. But it's so incredibly useful, and I use it all the time. So when you need to use Firebase, you're basically going to import it from the plugin, and then you initialize Firebase. You're al allowed to have some other options that you can pass in. But this is the basic uh, way of um, just firing up your app and then initializing Firebase. And then you're going to need to build the UI. So Here's where the Vue developers kind of prick up their ears, because they look at this markup and they think, this is weird. <laughs> so it's using, uh, it's using the Swipe Layout plugin and then some NativeScript modules like Grid Layout. And then in that is a card view and another NativeScript module. So it's a combination of plugins and NativeScript modules. So um, in a regular web view app, you'd have your template block in the single file component. Um, and then it would have you know, standard HTML markup. Well, we don't use that in NativeScript View. That's the big difference. So um, this is just something to keep in mind. If you want to build your mobile app, your UI is going to be considerably different because this is a native mobile app. So this is what it looks like. A couple, um, couple modules and a couple of plugins. 
And then I go ahead and I look at the images that I'm um, displaying on screen, and I pass those over to MLKit, which is running on device, right? This app can work offline. So um, you query MLKit, which is running on device, and you're passing over the images, and MLKit is returning labels. So you can say, I want labels with the accuracy of uh, 0.6 or maybe 0.7, a little bit more accurate. And um, then I'm going to take the uh, labels that it's giving me, and I'm going to uh, calculate a score, how accurate they are and how accurate I am. So I have a, um, an, an, an object here. It's, it's basically, I, I give, a, I give uh, the images a certain ID, and then I give the accepted answers that I'm expecting from the bot. So it's kind of like a, it's like a source of truth. So this is, um, this is how I'm getting the answers. And then I'm using Vuex to keep the score. So Vuex is Vue's state management, a little bit like Redux. So here I'm taking the human score and the bot score, and I'm just calculating what the score is coming through, and then I can save that as I, as I continue to swipe on the images. And here is the result. So I have a bunch of uh, images, and this is actually a very difficult one for the bot to understand. So it's chocolate ice cream or Dalmatians. It's not really easy. And then you can tell the bot gets confused. It's, it's just not sure what it's looking at. And you can see the score at the bottom. The human's doing way better. So there we go. It's not easy. Um, but sometimes, sometimes the bot is a little bit more accurate, especially with food images like bagels and things like that. So I would like to see if anyone here is able to beat the AI. So I'm going to fire up this app like this. Here it is. OK. So here is the app. And I have a selection of images to kind of sort through. So I have barn owls and apples, chihuahuas or muffins, chocolate or Dalmatian, croissant or dog, kitten or caramel, labradoodle or fried chicken, parrot or guacamole, puppy or bagel, sheepdog or mop, sheba or marshmallow, shrew or kiwi, sloth or bread or trump or chicken. Um, I'm not sure about the last one. We'll have to see how that goes. But I would love to have a volunteer. I have a prize. I have a t-shirt that you can win. If you would like to see if you can beat the AI, I'll give you the t-shirt whether you win or not. <laughs> so uh, I just need a volunteer. Come. You can do the next one. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so you can pick. pick. Yes, which one you'd like. Oh, it's gonna be this one. All right, Sheba or Marshmallow. So start the game. <laughs> <laughs> so I swipe right for Marshmallow and left for Sheba, right? Correct. Okay. okay. Oops. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> Oof. Let's try it. You want to try another one? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you lost horribly, but that's okay. Oh. <laughs> Let's try, I can't, there it is. Try a different one. I want to make sure the score is actually coming through. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to try this one. Okay. So Labradoodle's that way. Oh, oh that way. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think maybe you were doing the ramp. Oh. There we go. Mm -hmm. oh, see. That's chicken, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really good into Tinder. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, barely. <laughs> oh, it's a tie. Oh, interesting. Oh, I see a bug. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, very good. Oh, you got a T-shirt. There we go. Did you want to try? Okay. Uh, I can feel, I can see it's coming. <laughs> oh, there you go. So start the game. And that's the sheepdog, so that way, right? Not your styphones. That's okay. Let's try again. Oh, uh, let's just refresh this whole thing. Sorry. Pick me. Okay. Sheepdog or mop? This guy, right? Okay. 
You can swipe right on the card. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well done. Good job. Yes. Good job. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Anybody want me to do Trump versus chicken? I think. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> It's very difficult. <laughs> oh, fat fingered that one. Oh well, I think I think I was pretty accurate. But what I want to show is how the um, how quick the uh, ML kit comes back with labels because it's running on device. So the, po the whole point of this exercise is not actually uh, Trump versus chicken. It's actually talking about how fast um, ML kit can come back with labels and how you could run this thing offline. So um, that is a really cool thing to try. And you can certainly go ahead and use this now and today. And, um, and that is the end of this talk. And I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Any questions I can help with? Native script view, yes. Uh, are the machines able to make mistakes, innovative mistakes? Right? Yeah, I think so. So it's basically, um, well, I guess it depends on, uh, do you want them to make mistakes? <laughs> uh, the, the whole process of innovation it comes from unexpected or mm -hmm. unusual solutions. Mm -hmm. Are machines able to do this? I think they are, actually. And that's where we have reinforcement learning coming in, because they're basically getting more and more innovative and curious as they go, so the algorithm is getting more and more sophisticated as it goes. And it's like when the machines are innovating and not just us. And this is where people are getting a little bit nervous about losing control of the process. <laughs> I know in London, Deep Brain, they're looking at an off switch. So yeah, so yeah, but a, an excellent example would be um, they recently put a bunch of um, plants and medicines uh, towards an algorithm, and it was suggesting different combinations of different uh, plants and medicines to cure different diseases. So they're basically seeing if a machine learning algorithm could come up with different combinations of drugs that would help in innovative ways that we haven't thought of. So I think, you know, in this case, this is a really great use of this kind of innovative algorithm. So really fun. I personally want to put it against cocktails. I have a large database right on my computer right now of cocktails. I want to see if like, you can combine all different alcohols and create something really crazy. This is my next talk. <laughs> we will have samples, what the machine comes up with. <laughs> Sorry to, I, uh, I noticed in this app, uh, it's full of cute puppies. But, uh, because it's me. <laughs> yes, but if we put something disgusting or uh, offensive, the psychological factor will affect the hair. I don't think machines have psychological reaction. Well, it would just give me, you know, if I show pictures of manure, it will just say manure. You know, there's, it, it doesn't really care what we're feeling about this sort of thing. That's our job. Yeah. Yes, uh, but what I mean is that the comparison with humans and machines here cannot be exactly accurate because humans can be affected, can be faster or slower according to. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, but I think that one thing you notice is that the humans are usually just faster at figuring out what it is. So that's the only thing I'm measuring, yeah. But in terms of like how our emotions factor into that, that's a completely different question and that's a really interesting question. So it'd be interesting, you, what you should do is put a, a heart monitor or something on and see, you know, how I might like fire up my heart monitor on my watch and see how stressed out I get, especially when the app misbehaves. <laughs> so yeah, lots of good, good thoughts, interesting. Any other questions I can help with? Um, <laughs> I've been asked this, um, maybe, maybe I should do it, I don't know, it's, it's available, it's, it's all open source, so if you want to run it on your own machine, you can do that, it's on my GitHub, JLooper, and it's PickMe, so um, yeah, you can try it, <laughs> there's actually, uh, I need to do a couple fixes, obviously, so I'll fix it and then we'll see. <laughs> Great 
Great question. Um, it's not so much the plugin that takes up the space, it's the model. So what you have to do when you're doing any kind of machine learning um, in implemented app is um, make sure that model is frozen and compressed. And there are ways to do that on your local if you're training something custom and you put it on device. But you've noticed that some apps are, um, and Google Translate is the best example, they prompt you to download the model before you can use it. So when I came, the first time I came to Bulgaria, I downloaded the Bulgarian model. It wasn't there by default. So that's how they keep the apps kind of slim, and then you can delete that if you don't use that later. So that's kind of a really good strategy and an excellent question about how to manage, because they, yeah, they get beefy, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate your attention. Thank you.